The first part of this video about West Chesman Primary School covers its history from the very beginnings in the late 19th century to its demolition in 2008 and rebuilding shortly afterwards. As a past pupil together with my brothers and sister who attended the school between 1952 and 1972 we didn't know much of the school's history so this has been a fascinating journey of discovery. This is followed by Sharon introducing the work of a company called Pre-Construct Archaeology or PCA which was commissioned to document much of the school's past and capture images of the school and its fixtures and fittings prior to demolition. Most of this work was carried out between the 28th and 31st of August 2007. Sharon will then present and talk about many of the items that PCA discovered and will then take us on a guided tour of the school captured on video on the open day just prior to its demolition. Finally, we look at the images captured during the demolition process of the school, but close showing images of the new school that was built to replace the old one. In the latter part of the 19th century, the area we now know as West Jesmond was simply known as Jesmond. In 1864, as shown by the map, Jesmond was essentially just fields, although St Andrew's Cemetery can clearly be seen. The blue area shows where the school would eventually be located. By 1895, Jesmond was expanding quite a bit, and there was a need for a school. In 1897, the Newcastle upon Tyne School Board acquired the site where the school would eventually be built. Not much happened until the residents of Jesmond petitioned the board to provide at least an infant school. After much pressure, two years later, in 1899, the school's board conceived plans for an infant school for 300 pupils and commissioned the architect Charles Septimus Arrington to prepare plans. On the 17th of April 1901, Charles Errington provided plans and sections for a temporary iron and wood infant school. The original planned school layout can be seen here, with the proposed temporary infant school at the top facing Brentwood Avenue. The proposed positions of the permanent infant school building at the bottom of the drawing and the permanent junior and senior school buildings on the right of the drawing are also shown. If you notice the road running down by the junior and senior school building and down by the infant school was originally called Forsyth Road but later became an extension of Tankerville Terrace. This shows the position of the temporary infant school in more detail. This sketch shows the architect's vision of the school as one would see it from Brentwood Avenue. This detailed drawing shows the layout of the classrooms, three on the left for boys and three on the right for girls. Each classroom would accommodate 50 children, making the building suitable for 300 pupils in total. Noticeable is the permanent junior and senior school building, which was designed as a single building and not as a two separate building, as it later became. The single-storey temporary infant school building opened in August 1901, having cost £980, 14 shillings and tuppence. That's nearly £150,000 in today's money. The architect's drawings for the permanent infant school building of 1900 remain valid. The drawings shown here of the east and south elevations were completed in March 1903. The photograph here shows the building as it was in circa 1947. The ground floor layout is shown in this drawing. Clearly there were four classrooms each holding 50 infants. So the new infant school would accommodate 200 children. On the 28th of July 1902, the permanent single-storey infant school building, here in blue, was completed, together with an outside play shed and toilets and open for classes. The cost then was £7,443.13.9. 
Uh, today's cost that would be £1,008,826. The main contractor was Alexander Bruce, Clarker Works was the board's employee William Walker, and the hot water engineers were Messrs Dinning and Cook of the Percy Ironworks and Eldon Foundry. The original temporary iron and wood infant school building, still shown in red, now became a mixed senior school that accommodated 300 children. It was in use until 1905. In October 1903 there were 615 children in attendance at the school, showing just how necessary the school was. By July 1905 the two-storey boys building, now known as Lower Juniors, and the single-storey girls building, now known as Upper Juniors, were completed and in use. Both buildings here are shown in yellow. Two buildings were constructed rather than one originally planned. The caretaker's house, shown in green, was also completed by this time. By 1907 there was still no kitchen or canteen provision at the school. Some examples of the early class photographs between 1905 and 1911 are shown here. By 1921, the school is now shown on the Ordnance Survey map, with an increase in surrounding streets. The shape and position of the buildings can clearly be seen. Up until 1939, the school layout had changed very little. It is also not known when the boys' building became known as Lower Juniors, and the girls' building became known as Upper Juniors. From now on, I will refer to these buildings as Lower Junior School and Upper Junior School. 3rd of September 1939. Britain declares war on Germany. This begins World War II. The school became known as the West Jesmond Council School and was assessed for use as a temporary town hall because the local council believed the Luftwaffe would not target a school to be bombed. The Lower and Upper Junior School buildings were earmarked for council clerks and the infant school building for the Lord Mayor's office, council chambers and committee rooms. An air raid shelter was also proposed for room 4 in the Lower Junior School. This is highlighted in yellow. There is no evidence that this plan was ever implemented. The school closed in 1939 and 178 pupils and 8 staff were evacuated to Stanick School in Carlisle and the Upper Junior School building was designated an Emergency Rest and Feeding Centre for bombed out families. The school reopened in 1940 but only the Upper Junior School and Infant School buildings were used for classes. The Lower Junior School building remained closed. Brick air raid shelters with flat concrete roofs and wooden seats inside were built against the west wall of the schoolyard. The school survived the war unscathed, although on Monday 29th of July 1940, a high explosive bomb caused the death of a woman in Forsyth Road, not far from West Jesmond Primary School. In October 1946, the Upper Junior School building was opened as an Emergency Training College, or ETC, for teachers. The first students at the ETC comprised 80 men and 40 women, mostly ex-services personnel. Even though the photo is slightly blurred, it is a rare picture of the ETC class of 1946, sitting in the playground in front of the Upper Junior School building. Also, some of the ET staff sketched and painted various parts of the buildings, which provide a useful historical record. This map was published in 1947 and now shows the school with an expanding street construction parallel with the Great North Road. By 1949, additional classrooms were provided, which then became the dining room in the infant's playground. The photograph shows the dining room just to the side of the infant school. In 1953, the ETC was known as the College of Commerce. 
It was still functioning up to 1955 or 1956. The air raid shelters were probably demolished in the late 1960s and the northern boundary wall from Brentwood Avenue to the caretaker's house was replaced in 1997. So the sequences of changes to the buildings, here shown in red, at West Jesmond Primary School from 1905 to 2007 can be seen here. As shown in Plan 4, little had changed to the building since 1970 i.e. 37 years. The school ground layout as of 2007, just before demolition, is shown here. Much of the historical information in this section has been taken from the report by Preconstruct Archaeology, or PCA. They also captured images of parts of the building and its contents in 2007. A number of these follow, with a description by Sharon which is then followed by Sharon's tour of the buildings. I hope you enjoyed this history session. In August and October of 2007, just before the open day in November, a company called Preconstruct Archaeology from Durham was commissioned by Sir Robert McAlpine to undertake an on-site recording of West Jesmond Primary School in Newcastle upon Tyne of both the external buildings and internal fixtures and fittings prior to its demolition in 2008. West Jesmond Primary School, an Edwardian school, had no statutory protection and was therefore not a listed building. In accordance with standard practice, it was considered that much of the existing school complex, the earliest elements of which date back to 1902, to be of sufficient character and architectural merit to warrant photographic recording before demolition to provide a permanent record of the school as was. Accordingly, planning permission for the redevelopment was conditioned to the effect that no demolition should take place or construction begin until an archaeological record of the existing school was submitted to and approved by the local planning authority. Enter Preconstruct Archaeology and a very detailed and interesting report was produced by them and we have permission to use the information in this video. In summary, in the 106 years of the life of the school, it was shown that there had been little significant internal or external alteration to the original buildings and many fixtures and fittings original to construction of the various buildings had survived. The classrooms with their retractable timber partitions which open up the classrooms to the halls had remarkably changed little in overall appearance in those years. Much period detail survived from moulded brick, stonework, classroom doors, architraves and overlights to dated roof furniture which suggested that much of the roof scheme was original. Recommendations were made to retain for salvage a range of fixtures and fittings both from the original construction and some from later usage. Some of them you will see as I take you through a guided tour of the school in the open day video footage which follows this section. Before I share the findings, here is a layout of where the individual buildings are within the school premises and what I call them as I remember them. The infants, what seemed to be a very formidable building when you first started school. This is on Tankerville Terrace, opposite the Wooden Bridge, or Tar Bridge as it was originally known. The Lower Juniors is the large two-storey building. There is ground floor and first floor to this building, and it's situated on the corner of Brentwood Avenue and Tankerville Terrace. Years 1 and 2 were here. The Upper Juniors is the one-storey building. This is where you went after the Lower Juniors and before you went on to secondary school. Years 3 and 4 were here. The dining room, self-explanatory really, but originally used as classrooms. The caretaker's house. I can honestly say I never knew there was a caretaker's house in the school, but it is in fact a standalone Edwardian house within the premises. The infant's play shed, and this was in the infant's yard. When I was there, I distinctly remember using the word standard instead of year, so standard four was the final year. I don't know if anyone else remembers this, but let me know in the comments section of this video if you do. You will notice that some photos that follow have small plans attached to them, 
by Ian, which identify where an object was found within a particular building by pre-construct archaeology. The R numbers on them are room numbers assigned by pre-construct archaeology for their purposes and do not represent the actual identity of the rooms. Ning and Cook radiators. These were original cast iron radiators from the heating and ventilating engineers Dinning and Cook from the Percy Iron Works in Newcastle upon Tyne. They're very noticeable in the open day video footage as they are predominantly painted a royal blue colour. However, some are painted in a cream colour like this one behind me in one of the lower junior classrooms. You can just see the Dinning and Cook oval trade plate on the right at the top of the radiator. Although like many, they have been well painted over. This photo shows one in the lower juniors building. At least 16 of these radiators were found in the classrooms throughout the school. Two were found in the lower juniors building, 11 in the upper juniors building and three in the infants and quite a few more which were identified as possibly original. This photo here shows one of the original radiators with the Dinning and Cook trade plate which was found in the hall in the single story upper juniors building and which can be seen in my video. See if you can spot it. This photo shows one of the original radiators found in the infant's hall with the oval Dinning and Cook trade plate on the right hand side of the radiator towards the top. This also had the model name Jobson on it. Here is an example of what the trade plate on the radiator may have looked like on installation. The radiators would no doubt have been black back then. The William Brownie Garden Revolving Surface Writing Board, or Blackboard as we used to call them. As I talk about the history of these boards, I'll show you some in situ in the lower juniors and upper juniors. The Revolving Surface Writing Board, as it was originally known, was invented by a Scottish man called William Brownie Garden in 1911 and manufactured by his company Wilson and Garden Limited in Kilsyth near Glasgow in Scotland. The problem with the previous slate blackboards was brought to Garden's attention by the rector of Kilsyth Academy who said that the slate blackboards had limitations including constantly having to clean them, small teachers couldn't reach the top of the board and tall teachers struggled with the bottom. Enter William Brownie Garden and the revolving surface writing board made of specially treated fabric instead of slate was invented. The term is a bit of a mouthful so from here on in I'll just call them blackboards. These are very noticeable in the open day video footage. Some are bigger than others, some are freestanding and some are fixed to the wall. They were installed before 1946 or 1947. This photo, I know it's out of focus, but it shows an emergency teaching college teacher in a classroom in the upper juniors around 1946 or 1947, standing beside a traditional flip type blackboard, but just off centre is a revolving blackboard. A total of 15 of these blackboards were found in the classrooms, eight in the lower juniors, seven in the upper juniors, but none in the infants. This one here is a freestanding one found in a classroom on the ground floor of the lower juniors. This blackboard is one of the larger ones at West Jasmine School, found in the upper juniors, not freestanding but attached to the wall and was supplied by Tidmarsh and Sons of London. This photo here shows the supplier's trade plate on the wooden part of the board. The original prototype of the revolving blackboard is still in use today, one of the largest of which is in the Martin Wood Lecture Theatre of the Physics Department of the Clarendon Laboratory in Oxford University. It stands at approximately 20 feet in height. Another is also found in the Lindemann Lecture Theatre. The Bakelite Radio Channel Control Panel. As Ian said in the history section, during the time of the Emergency Training College, Four rediffusion points were installed in the school to allow for wireless broadcasts. This photo shows an original Bakelite radio channel control panel marked rediffusion. This was known to have been installed in 1948. Here it is in situ in the corner of the upper juniors hall to the right of the classroom door of what was Mrs. Robson's class when I was there in 1972. Look out for it on my video footage coming up soon. The memorial plaque. This is an embossed copper memorial plaque 
in remembrance to 54 former pupils and staff killed in the First World War. It was located on the first floor of the Lower Juniors building at the top of the staircase on the west wall. This is the junction of Brentwood Avenue and Tankerville Terrace. The doors. Not all of the doors were original, but this is one of them, one of the two classroom doors in the Infants building. A few more. This one found in the Lower Juniors building, showing the original door, the door furniture, as in the handle, and the overlight. And this photo shows the original double doors leading from the hall in the Upper Juniors building through to the exit. And this shows some original door furniture in the Infants building. Foldable classroom partitions. I never knew until the making of this video that the classrooms in the infants, lower juniors and upper juniors had wooden foldable partitions so that the classrooms could be opened up into the halls. I'm not sure why that would be of any benefit and were they actually used at all. It would be interesting to know if anyone remembers. If you do, please leave a comment under the video. This shows the original wooden foldable partition and door to one of the classrooms in the Upper Juniors. This photo shows the Upper Juniors Hall around 1946 or 1947. You can clearly see the wooden foldable partition to one of the classrooms on the right with all of the windows. Similarly, you can see the classroom at the back with the door on the right. To put this into context when I was there, Mrs. Robson's classroom is on the bottom left and Mrs. Richardson's is on the bottom right. Jump to 2007 and this is a similar view of the hall. The foldable partitions are still there but most of the glass is covered. Similarly, the classroom at the back has been covered up. This shows the wooden foldable partitions in the lower juniors and this shows the wooden foldable partitions in the infants. Gates, pillars and railings. This photo shows the original gates, gate pillars and adjoining railings to the infants building in front of the dining room. This is on Tankable Terrace, just opposite the wooden bridge over the railway line. You can see the word infants on the left pillar and this photo shows the detail on the pillar. It's amazing that any of the original railings survived as most of them were removed during the Second World War to be melted down for use in ammunition. This photo shows a drawing by one of the ETC students in around 1966-1967. It shows the kitchen extension of the caretaker's house, which can be seen on the very right of the picture, and shows the railings removed during World War II. The flooring. Although the wooden flooring throughout the classrooms and halls of the school is not original to the buildings themselves, it can be dated back to probably the post-1950s, so it still means it could have been around 57 years old at the time of the demolition of the school. The floors all look immaculate in the photos and video footage. Notice also on these photos the wooden foldable partitions to the classrooms. They appear more obvious as partitions since most of the artwork has been removed ready for the demolition of the school. Some original radiators can also be seen. Notice the ceilings too in the three halls. The lower juniors hall on the first floor has an obvious suspended ceiling as you can see the window at the end of the hall is cut off. But you can see the original exposed feet of the trusses resting on the corbels. Compare this to the upper juniors and infants halls which have the original high ceilings. There is, however, some original flooring and picture rail in one of the rooms in the Upper Juniors building. Perhaps this was what the flooring looked like originally for the 50 years from 1901 through to the post-1950s. Other artefacts were also found and possibly an original first aid box. This photo here shows an original window in the Lower Juniors building on the ground floor south facade. This is an original window and fittings in the caretaker's house. And another two windows in the caretaker's house. This is the first aid box, possibly original, with the trade plate Brady and Martin, Newcastle on Tyne, found in the infant's building next to the main entrance. 
A brick was found in the Lower Juniors playground on the southwest wall with Henshaw Brickworks of County Durham on it. A bell was found on the infant's building wall, which is probably from the 1960s. This photo shows a fluted cup handle on a classroom partition in the infant's building. Original windows with painted glass panels were found in the Lower Juniors building and an original window with a painted glass panel found in the headmistress's room in the Lower Juniors building. This shows some original architrave in the Lower Juniors building and this an original brass window stay on the north window of the Lower Juniors hall. See the open day video footage in the next section. Keep in mind when you are watching the floors, the blackboards, the ceilings, the radiators and the classroom partitions. I arrived at the open day on November the 3rd, 2007, when the school was opened to ex-pupils, ex-teachers, ex-staff and locals to allow them to have a last look around the school before it was demolished. It was 42 years since I'd first set foot on the school premises and as I walked up to the infant's entrance, it was very surreal and instantly brought back so many memories. It was quite overwhelming and emotional, I have to say, and although I don't have memories of those very early school days, it somehow took me right back to 1965 when I first started. Going inside now, and this is the corridor leading up to the hall, but to the left here, you can see the little coat pegs on the wall. Painted brick walls, the dado rails. Just the smell of the place took me back in time. Through the double doors we go through to the infants hall. I so remember the polished floors of the school and those high windows and the high ceiling. There were two infant classrooms here, this is one of them. Look at those little chairs and tables, it just took me right back to school days. Miss Harrison was the head teacher of the infants in 1965 when I was there, soon to be followed by Miss Trotter in 1967. Here is the other classroom. Just a little information here, there were originally two separate parts to the school, one being called West Jesmond Infant School and the other being West Jesmond Junior School, each with their own headmistress up until September 1997, when the infants and junior schools amalgamated to become West Jesmond Primary School. This was the dining hall. To this day, I'm not keen on meat pies. And this is the infant's playground with St Andrew's Cemetery beyond the wall and the infant play shed. Here is the entrance from the infant's part of the school to the junior part. My first impression was that the playground seemed to be much bigger from how I remembered it. On the far side is the two-storey lower juniors and the single-storey building on the right here is the upper juniors. Then I remembered there used to be two play sheds which separated the lower junior playground from the upper one. This photo here shows a summer fete in 1969 showing one play shed and this showing the play shed on the other side in the lower juniors playground. The porter cabins weren't here either. My first venture into one of the classrooms in the lower juniors and what sprung to mind straight away was of course the revolving blackboard, the old style radiator, those high windows and the polished floors. It all brought back so many memories. On the open day there was a computer set up in the lower junior hall showing old class photos which funnily enough as I approached it had a class photo on the screen which was very familiar as I owned a copy of it. It was Miss Stevenson's class of 1968. A lady who was obviously doing some research wondered if I knew the names of any of the pupils, so I obliged by recalling almost everybody's name in the photo. I'm actually pointing at myself on the computer in this photo. Here I'm pointing at a boy called Knox Huggy. Here is my photo 
taken in the lower junior hall on the first floor and I am sitting on the right at the end, two rows up. If anyone recognises themselves, let me know in the comment section below the video. I'd love to know how you're doing. After all, it's been 55 years since the photo was taken. The old registers were also available to look through, so I then just had to find myself and my brothers in the registers. Here's Ian. Barry, and this is my uncle Russell who also attended the school from 1937. This photo here shows my uncle Russell with Ian and Barry taken at Whitley Bay, complete with their West Jesmond Junior School ties and caps on. This is my brother Ross, and last but not least, here's me with my West Jesmond Junior School tie on. I also managed to find my uncle Brian, who attended the school from 1935, mission completed. So this is the upper juniors, where there were six classrooms, and you would go here after the lower juniors and before you went on to secondary school. You can see from this photo, looking up from the main entrance, where the two play sheds used to be in the playground. These were demolished in 2001. This was Mrs. Richardson's class in the Upper Juniors when I was there in 1972, bottom right in the hall. Now this did take me back in time. I remember the desks were arranged around the perimeter of the class and my desk was in the corner, on the end, below the window, next to a Simon Norris who unfortunately isn't with us anymore. I do remember an Oxhaggy and a Malcolm Stone sitting at the back. This is the juniors hall, the upper juniors, and you can see the long wooden benches on the polished floors, and you can quite clearly see the wooden foldable classroom partitions and the double doors to the exit. The big window at the end of the hall with the wooden benches underneath. This was Mr. Curzon's classroom when I was there. And this is the playground where you can see the infants and the other juniors. The photo shows where the play shed used to be at the entrance through to the infants and this photo shows it being demolished in 2001. You can see scaffold boards have been placed under the roof to stop tiles from falling off the roof. This is the same throughout the school and gives an indication as to the state of the school itself. of the building. Um, I came to the school in 95 and even then there was a huge backlog of major problems to do with the roof, the structure of the building, the whole fabric of the building, um, which was, it was no longer viable. And we did look at the option of complete refurbishment to try and, and create the right environment by keeping the shell really. But we had several different groups working on that and it just, it just wasn't going to happen. And so working with the planners, then new build was the, the obvious answer.